good afternoon ladies and gentlemen i say good afternoon from delhi where the temperature is only 42 degrees celsius now we are assembled here for the iic program and uh, it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the india international center though i am not there i am uh, at home now this distinguished uh, assembly consists of two parts the visible and the invisible obviously the visible is there only because they want to be with the invisible we wish we could have had a technology where all of us would have been visible now we have a distinguished uh, set of panelists i start with uh, professor uh, p r kumaraswamy who is director of the middle east institute as well as uh, professor at uh, center for west asia studies uh, the jawaharlal nehru university then we have uh, professor bansidar prathan again from the center for west asia studies uh, jawaharlal nehru university and then we have dr john cherian consulting editor the front line now we also have uh, not among the visible but among the invisible tete the chief of uh, the program division of iic who brought all of us together thank you tete now considering the theme that we are going to discuss well we have to look at the context in israel there is a political crisis there will be a session of the knesset which will decide on the on sunday this sunday whether a new government to succeed prime minister netanyahu will be brought into being i was wondering whether we could imagine an extra terrestrial terrestrial being extra terrestrial being etb observing the human condition for centuries looking at what is happening in this part of the world namely israel and the occupied territories well that etb might make the following observations one american weapons have been used by israel to smash into smithereens residential blocks media offices international media offices infrastructure for water and electricity and much more in gaza and we have the same america saying that it is keen to rebuild all that has been destroyed well how generous of america to provide weapons to destroy and then later to provide the funds to rebuild second question the etb might raise why did the crisis occur exactly when it did lapid knesset member and what in israel they call an alternate prime minister quote and quote 
not it, you know, fully um, ra uh, ratified, approved by the Knesset. Now, he has said that this crisis would not have occurred if Israel had a stable ministry, a stable government. Obviously, he's implying that uh, perhaps the prime, that the uh, caretaker prime minister Netanyahu might have had some interest in the timing. Well, we need to find out more. Third question will be about the precision weapons supplied by the United States. They were so precise they could destroy, as we said earlier, the residential buildings, even a lab which was uh, uh, put up, uh, set up in connection with uh, coronavirus. Even a library. So these weapons are really precise. The next question will be about the paralysis of the UN Security Council. Why did it happen? And what were the P10 doing? You know, Security Council, there are 15 members. We have the permanent five, P5, and then the non-permanent, P10. What were they doing? And in that context, what did India do? And the last question, from the ETB will be what next? So we have uh, these distinguished speakers already mentioned. They have agreed to speak for uh, 12 minutes or less, <coughs> giving us enough time for Q&A, the most important part of our program. Now you are requested, ladies and gentlemen, to write your questions down and put it on the chat box. If you like, you may address your question to a specific panelist. Now the order of the day is as follows. Uh, we would have first uh, Professor Kumaraswamy, then Professor Prathan, and then Dr. John Cherian. Let us now request uh, Professor Kumaraswamy to address us. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ambassador. And um, thank you, IIC, for inviting me for this uh, discussion. And uh, thanks to my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. A few years ago, a, a friend of mine told me, India has more experts on Israel than the population of Israel itself. So pe people of this country have a good idea of the big issues. So whatever I'm going to say may be a repetition of what people already know. But still, for highlighting the importance, let me make a few broad points. For a lot of time, we were talking about Arab Israeli conflict conflict between Israel and the neighboring Arab states. But after Egypt moved away and established a separate peace, gradually we were looking at Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And largely because Egypt decided to pursue its national interests and it prioritized Egyptian interests over larger Palestinian issue. The same approach enabled China and India to normalize relations. If you look at before 92, China was openly saying we will have relations with Israel after the establishment of a Palestinian state. But when they established in, in 92, Palestinian state was not there. Then came Jordan in 96. And last year, Four more Arab countries normalized relations with it. In other words, it is no longer an Arab Israeli conflict. It is largely an Israeli Palestinian conflict for the last two to three decades. What is happening now 
even this is being marginalized it has been presented as an israeli hamas conflict the three rounds of conflict the region witnessed in 2008 and 9 2012 2014 was confined to israel and hamas in the gaza strip this time around it was largely the case but there were problems in the west bank unlike the previous time west bank was not completely quiet there was skirmishes protests and violence and deaths but there were no rockets from the west bank in other words no active violence against israel as was the case from the gaza strip this time israel also witnessed internal crisis in the form of jewish arab riots at different parts of the country which never happened from 48 and israel also faced a few rockets from the north therefore if you look at all the four frontiers that is gaza strip west bank israel proper and the northern israel you can say that this is one of the worst crises israel has ever faced since 1948 but how did we get there we can go into any number of arguments but largely speaking it is a stalemate which has led to this crisis we can identify the spark which created the tension but we can start from 1967 we can start in 1948 when israel was created we can go back to balfour declaration of 1917 or even you can go back to 637 when jerusalem became arab and islamic depending upon our convenience we can go back and start our narrative but what is important is the stalemate is a prime cause israel had no intention to move towards peace especially under netanyahu and the palestinian authority was not able to make any headway in the peace process hamas was fighting with the palestinian leadership ever since its foundation in 1988 they were challenging every single institution created by yasser arafat fatah plo and eventually the palestinian authority my understanding is the possible electoral victory of hamas was one of the prime reason why the parliamentary elections scheduled for may was cancelled by the palestinian president mahmoud abbas in these circumstances what is biden's position biden knows israel since golda meir in person he knew all the israeli leaders he is presenting himself as a friend of israel but he is not the friend of israel on the models of Donald Trump and if you look at in the last 4 years Trump and Netanyahu had established a very close relationship and that is why Netanyahu broke the normal conventional Israeli practice to greet the person who is elected from the other side he never called congratulated even tweeted when Biden uh, Harris team was chosen for the uh, republican for the democrats candidates it was only very late he congratulated biden after his election and biden reciprocated the same way he took a month to talk to netanyahu netanyahu was not among the first person he called but once the crisis began biden began to change Initially he blocked the UN Security Council uh, from adopting any resolutions. UN Security Council is the highest elected body we all know that. But we have to be reminded that it is a political body. Countries take a position in the UN Security Council depending upon the respective national interest. They are not it is not a legal body. it is not a theological seminary to talk about moral rights and wrongs no 15 countries decide what is good for their own national interests and you has decided to block any resolution from passing but once the casualties began to rise 
on the eighth day of the conflict, Biden began to call for a ceasefire. Initially, Netanyahu was not eager. He said, we don't have a time frame to work. But then he recognized the back channel pressure was enormous. Even though Biden has a large number of Jewish persons as in the cabinet, the Jews of Biden's cabinet are left of the center. They represent the liberal wing of the American Jewry. And some of them are members of the J Street, not the hardline uh, positions. So therefore, the support for Israel with certain caveat. And that is why Biden was able to establish a ceasefire in three days' time after his actual call. It may not be very large, but if you look at it, in 2014, Obama took 50 days to bring about the ceasefire. But the ceasefire is only the step one. With everybody knows, you need to show up means you need to reconstruct. And the reconstruction is going to be very difficult than what we think. Hamas wants to play a leading role in the reconstruction. But Egypt, Israel, Palestinian Authority and the United States do not want Hamas to play a leading role. Hamas wants Qatar to play a leading role. But from what we know is this, that Qatari assistance to Hamas enable Hamas to reconstruct Gaza after 2014, but it also enabled Hamas to develop military weapons and systems. Some of the financial assistance from outside were used to build tunnels, to develop rockets. So the money was used by Hamas, whatever it thought necessary. You can argue that, you know, Hamas needs rockets to compel Israel to, uh, to give concessions to negotiate. Fair enough. But at the same time, when you are using the taxpayers' money of the United States in terms of building tunnels and rockets, you have to ask a lot of questions. And if you remember, this is the kind of argument which got Trump in the first place into the White House. So what I'm looking at is, while Hamas cannot be ignored, and uh, Hamas' role in the reconstruction will undermine the international role in the reconstruction of Gaza. This is where we have an unusual puzzle, Iran. If you look at it, Biden administration has been paying attention to the nuclear negotiations in Vienna. And both because he was part of the Obama uh, administration's nuclear deal, and partly because the Europeans want to play an active role, nuclear deal is a priority of Joe Biden. And for the same reason, Iran is also not very active in the whole crisis. The support for Hamas was very limited. It also managed to reign in Hezbollah during the crisis. But the Gaza crisis created two problems. One, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot be put aside anymore. And Biden administration will have to involve actively in mediation and post ceasefire efforts, which means Iran will not get complete undiluted attention of the Biden administration. You like to compromise. And the second thing is, if you want a compromise on Gaza Strip, you need Israeli cooperation. But Israeli cooperation will come with a condition, conditions, meaning Israeli position will have to be accommodated when you are looking at the Iran fight. In short, Biden will not be able to ignore Israel as Obama did when dealing with the Iranians. Final word, what is the way out? The way out will be a two-state solution. There is a small hope because there is going to be a new government which is likely to come on Sunday. 
in india a person can be sworn in as a prime minister and uh, given 15 days to prove his majority in israel it works the other way around a person becomes a prime minister only after he or she proves a majority in the cabinet so that is going to take place on sunday it's a very unwieldy coalition it's a very narrow coalition of 61 59 but there is one interesting development in spite of all the tensions it will not be headed by netanyahu netanyahu was having a confrontation his position towards the united states especially during obama time that is going to be an interesting thing so it is going to be a long painful process anything can go wrong even a small incident can go wrong but the formation of a new government gives a little hope for a more positive middle eastern scenario thank you very much thank you professor kumar Swami, for that uh, fairly comprehensive uh, presentation uh, you said that uh, president biden brought in a ceasefire and that uh, on the last occasion it was 52 days this time it was only 11 days two things one is that we also know that uh, president biden used the expression ceasefire only after seven or eight days as yourself mentioned so the question is whether he was waiting for permission from uh, Netanyahu to use that expression. Second, you said about uh, Netanyahu not uh, felicitating President Biden and his, uh, you know, sort of retaliating, not by returning uh, Netanyahu's phone call. It took him more than a month or about a month to return the call. But once the conflict started, Biden started calling Netanyahu, I do not know whether every day or every other day. Question is whether Biden's recipe of uh, private pleading and public supporting, did it work or did it make any sense? Now, we have the next speaker and that is uh, Professor uh, Prathan. Let us request him to address us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very good afternoon to all. A very a big thanks uh, for this invitation, particularly Ambassador Fabian and IIC. Now, let me, the uh, title of the talk is Israel-Palestine Dispute. Uh, let me take the debate to a different level because I am a little uncomfortable with this, these titles which are um, under which uh, this issue is being discussed. For me, it is a much more complex, uh, you know, if you talk about dispute, violence in the conflict, then the basically one, you neglect the vast imbalance of power, asymmetry of power, two, which is more important, you sideline the core of the issue at stake. For me, and uh, I will try to argue along those lines, it is basically Israeli settler colonial conquest and occupation versus Palestinian resistance. What we have been witnessing is a consequence of that. Now, the point here is, let me tell you, let, let me try to contextualize the continual large-scale killing of innocent Palestinian civilians, large-scale death, destruction, and overall devastation on the Palestinian side caused by the Israel war machine. Why is it that? Let me give you some statistics about this present crisis, the 2021 war on Gaza. War on Gaza. Six high-rise buildings, all iconic city landmarks have been flattened. It includes 184 residential and commercial uh, properties that have been destroyed. It includes the iconic Al Jala Tower, which housed media or uh, um, outlets, the Masrik Media Foundation uh, Production Center, which is, a, uh, which is a very lively experiment with the Palestinian journalists and other things, and uh, 15 healthcare centers, water desalination plant, doctors, 
the COVID center. Overall, 2,000 buildings have been completely destroyed and 15,000 buildings have been, un or have been rendered unusable. Now the casualty, as usually, very disproportionate on the Palestinian side, 248 in Gaza, 31 West Bank, people are, uh, there is a general misperception that nothing is happening in the West Bank. Yes, nothing is happening in the press, but some uh, things are happening on the ground. Now, and uh, yes, 31 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank, and from the Israel side, 13, 13 Israelis. Now, uh, you know, 70, more than 75,000 Palestinians have been displaced. And uh, the those who were killed included children and women vulnerable. Now, the YTI, um, um, you know, provided this brief statistics. This statistics, to me, the what happened in Gaza during May 10 and 21, you know, is, uh, you know, it's nothing unusual or nothing surprising. It it conforms to a particular pattern of the Israeli state behavior vis-a-vis vis the Palestinian in general and those living in Gaza in particular, especially since 2018, 2009. This is the fourth such operation. Now, this uh, underlines uh, three basic features of the Israeli state behavior towards the Palestinians. One, always try to you go analyze all the attacks, you know, Operation Cast Lead, Operation Pillar of Defense, Operation Protective Ads, and the one. These are major ones. There are many minor ones. You see, always there will be a pretext. Israel will, would create a pretext to justify and legitimize the attack, massive attack, ravaging attack on the Gazans. Now, second, you know, these are always everywhere. In every operation, these three features you'll see, invariably, all, all of them. And second is inflicting heavy punishment on the entire population and their civil population. And third, deliberate killing of civilians and destruction of civilian structure through use of disproportionate military power. Now, why is it Israel doing this? I have an immediate that can be immediate objective and long-term objective. Immediate objective here is obviously in response to the rocket fires from uh, Gaza. But you must understand, many people normally forget, why did the Hamas fire those rockets? Because these, these are symbolic resistance. Because you have what happened in Sheikh Zara expulsion, then what happened in Temple Mount and Temple Mount or Har al Sarif compound. That is in response to that. Because Fatah led PA was totally immobile, totally incapable of responding to the Israeli atrocities as the Palestinians perceive this. Now, therefore, now this is, why is it happening? Why is it happening? This is a long term. The long term objective, this is immediate, long term objective is, which runs through all the operations, is basically what I call the de-Palestinianization or to depopulate Palestinians to Gaza and particularly Gaza, you know, through a process of this process of deep Palestinianization refers to a process of deliberate and methodically killing of Palestinians, destruction of all their infrastructure, confiscation of the confiscation of the land, so on and so forth. So this 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 is part of the game. It's going and this is not going to be this is not the first one, nor is it going to be the last one. There can be many more. That's that. that that's why I'm, I'm trying to see a pattern so those so that we can contextualize the continual violence or continuing killing. Now, what could be the reasons? Reasons could be the ideology, we must find the ideological reasons. This is what I've been arguing. Why this Israeli state behavior is like this towards the Palestinians is because, especially after the second intifada, you saw the resonance or the what is called the neo Zionist consensus is, you know, getting traction in Israel society. It includes almost all the political parties except the communists and the peace more peace now peace peacemakers also, or those who are arguing for peace across the political class. Now, what is that? This neo Zionist consensus revolves around the very idea of Israel. These people argue they, they argue that Israel is still in an existential crisis. It is still fighting for its existence, which to me is a totally untenable logic, ridiculous logic as of now. Yes, from 48 to 67, one can understand that David Goliath syndrome. Now it, is, it has been reversed. Now, point here is now, you know, therefore, the, the argument here is that the Israel state of Israel, of Jews are facing existential threat, threat from Arab Palestinians within Israel. 
and the Palestinians in the occupied territories. So therefore, this is the, therefore Palestinians still pose a threat to the very existence of Israel. And there can be nothing further from, from, from two than this. Now, therefore, as a result, you know, this is nothing new. You see, from the very beginning, 1948 till 1948, the Zionists, so please remember, so therefore my argument is the Zionist settler colonial project is still on. This is the second phase we are, dis we are witnessing. The first phase was when the Zionists were arguing for a homeland, which the interested community provided them with the UN resolution, with the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Now, after 1967, the occupation, you must remember, the first settlement was built, if my information is right, in East Jerusalem as early as 1968. So after 1967, you know, there has been two schools of thought in Israel, you know, moving along party lines, Lever and Likud, sociological school of thought and territorial school of thought. The territorial school of thought propounded by the Likudings, Likud, uh, Likud party, always believed that it is possible to annex and make it part of British Israel. The socialist school of thought propounded by the labor party said it is not possible. Therefore, they have been thinking, toying with the idea of you know 60 40, some 60 percent will annex, 40 percent leave it to Palestine. This is the Allen plan, you know, and this Allen plan was given a trial or experimental, experiment in Oslo. Oslo was not acceptable to the to Likud, and especially after Ariel Sharon came, Ariel Sharon 2003, as earlier as 2003, Ariel Sharon said Oslo is dead. And he also said, 1948 is not over. That is, a, that is the first part. So therefore, the colonial, settler colonial project is on. We must understand that. And then only you can reach the core of the issue and try to find a solution. Now, therefore, and as a result of course, the long-term policy has been to depopulate, depalestinization. See, otherwise, the choice by being provided to Palestinians is very stark, very simple choice. Either you leave, LEAV as occupied, subjugated, oppressed, and an apartheid system, or leave LIV, leave Palestine. That's therefore they can navigate Israel. So you see, the Jewish national law is in the in, along those lines, 2000, uh, 2018. Okay. Now this uh, as far as the long-term policy is concerned, Israel has been follow, following just two 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 ways. You know, one is uh, it, towards West Bank, it is different towards Gaza is different. Toward the West Bank, it's a very silent, subtle, creeping annexation and occupation. And towards Gaza, it's a very militaristic policy, which is a reflection of this all these years, you know. Now, now you know, now the, the, the problem is, uh, you know, um, the, therefore the Israel political class has been very well successfully securitized the political discourse in the, in the within Israel. So everything, security is the main issue, not peace. Security, they are facing security threat. Now, as far as, you know, they, in the, the, it has two purposes. One, domestic purposes. It it it, 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 it um, gives rich political dividends, which Netanyahu has been reaping until the, this last crisis. Last crisis, it didn't work, work the way it, he wanted it to work. And and most importantly, it does the peace process. The peace process. Peace process. This is the, the the attention, the focus on Gaza has been always to divert the world attention and Israel attention from the peace process, or else Israel will be asked to join the peace process. The argument is Hamas is an alibi, Hamas is an excuse, Hamas is there, as long as it is there, we will not be able to join the peace process. Now, therefore, from Hamas perspective, Hamas perspective, it's Hamas clearly argues, yes, we are fighting rockets. This is a symbol of resistance. This we are resisting Israel occupation. We are not going to accept Israel occupation. Now, you know, and Hamas has made many peace overtures, which while is not um, taking note of, and Israelis are, are not, uh, not never mentioned those things. Many probably they don't recognize even that, you know. And please remember, the most worrying aspect for the Israelis should be that this message, though not method of Hamas, is getting wider traction within the Palestinian community, including West Bank. You remember when Anthony Blinken was having talks with, yeah, with Mohammed Abbas in his luxurious apartment in Palestine standard, what were the slogans outside in Ramallah? Slogans where, you know, America is the head of the snake. You know, security cooperation is shameful. Oslo is dead. So therefore, there's a beautiful article by Ramji Murat, 
you know, in Palestine Chronicle, the, you know, the uh, humbling king of Palestine, the Palestinians are defeating Oslo culture. Oslo as a framework of peace or paradigm is dead long back. Now, Oslo culture is being questioned by the Palestinians. In other words, and these demonstrators were not merely non, not Hamas. Fatah supporters were, including Abbas Fatah. They were there. So we must understand the wider traction of Hamas message within the Palestinians. Abbas is completely, completely, you know, unable to do anything. He's just probably, people say, trying to save his own throne, as people are arguing that. So therefore, now, the political um, reason, this ideology, the policy, political, you know, you know, so the object has been to crush Palestinian resistance, eliminate Palestinian nationalism and identity. Political dividends, Netanyahu has reaped many political dividends, 2008, 2009, and you know, 12, 12, 14, and all. Now, obviously, it went the other way around. Now, the, uh, why is Israel succeeding in this? Two quick points. One, you know, the, 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 you know, the awesome military power and a well-calibrated media strategy till, till this crisis. This crisis was different. And blind U.S. support, uncritical U.S. approach, Arab apathy, and lack of effective interest intervention. Now, within a minute, two, uh, what is the way out? The way out, you know, the way out is, I know, so far, Israel has been in, in denial, denying Palestinian history, denying Palestinian identity, denying Palestinian right to national self-determination. Time has come, Israelis must realize. And the, the, there are hopeful signs because the new language is being taught, new discourse is in force, new, dis, new debate is, uh, is, you know, you see, this crisis, latest one, has united Prof. Palestine, Prof. all the Palestinians in the historical Palestine, Prof. within Prof. Israel, Yes, man. Kindly, Gaza. Okay. Now, therefore, yeah. there are the list list of of within uh, sixty seconds. Okay. Uh, I think um, uh, solution, two-state solution. I think still, I would like to believe that it is a still uh, provide some modicum of solution. But before it is too late, as it is said, yesterday would have been better. Tomorrow will be too late, or else Israel will have to face the uncomfortable truth of living or moving towards one state solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Prathan, for that in-depth analysis of uh, what has happened and what is happening and perhaps what might be happening. At the outset, you made a remark about the title. You said that uh, when you speak of Israel-Palestine dispute, you, one gets the impression that the two sides are having equal status. You are absolutely right. What uh, they have in the West Bank is only municipal autonomy. But uh, very technically, we have an embassy of the state of Palestine. We also have an embassy of Israel. So very technically, it is Israel-Palestinian dispute. And thank you so much for bringing in the human angle, which scholars at times forget. Now let us request Dr. John Sherian to address us. Panelists, distinguished fellow panelists, nothing much to add after the two speakers uh, spoke at such great lengths about the problem. But I think I will uh, stick to the problem of, can you hear me? I'm getting an echo. Yeah. So we can I, hear you. Uh, to, uh, yeah, okay. okay. I'll remove my, uh, I'll remove my, yeah. Okay, so I will um, basically stick to the conflict in Gaza. Uh, you know, the fourth war on Gaza was inevitable. Uh, you know, Israel does this, uh, you know, attacks Gaza once every three years, once every four years. This, in Israel, they call it, you know, many, even the mainstream media, they call it mow, mowing the grass. You got, they say you got to mow the grass regularly so that, you know, there are no snakes and scorpions in your backyard. So Gaza is considered uh, your backyard. 
So, and so this war was inevitable. The, the rocket attacks by Hamas, they were, they were just uh, an excuse. I mean, you know, Hamas sent in a few rockets. Everybody knew that they would, uh, it, would it was going to happen because uh, the Israelis refused to uh, uh, stop their actions in the uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque in, uh, uh, in East Jerusalem. And uh, so it was expected. And, and the second reason why Israel attacked Gaza was uh, Netanyahu's uh, you know, great urge to remain as prime minister. So he thought that you know, this attack on, uh, on Gaza would make the religious parties come back to him, come back to his fold, and there was no way that the Palestinian, the small Palestinian party, which uh, has now agreed to uh, support the new coalition government in Israel, will uh, continue with the talks with uh, the other Jewish parties. So I think it has been a big failure for Israel, this latest attack on Gaza. Uh, because uh, international opinion has, I think, uh, quite uh, radically changed. You saw the protests all over the world. I think London was one of the biggest protests in all the Western capitals. The government of UK, Boris Johnson, is one of the best friends of, uh, uh, continues to be a, best, a good friend of Israel. So, so does uh, the president of France. In fact, uh, uh, Netanyahu uh, personally thanked uh, these two leaders. He did not thank Mr. Modi. I don't know why, though Mr. Modi abstained in the, uh, you know, UNHRC resolution on on the Gaza conflict. So I think the attack on Gaza was mainly, you know, it's you know it was uh, for uh, testing new Israeli weapons. And I, I, I mean, the Israeli military planners have openly talked about it. Because if uh, this, you know, nothing, nothing better than testing your weaponry on, you know, human targets. If, if it succeeds, uh, well, there will there are going to be a lot of buyers. And Israel has shown after every attack on Gaza how the technology is much better than the techno, as not much better, as good as the technology which the Americans and the Russians are able to provide. Now the killer drones which have which were used in Gaza, they, I believe, they were, uh, you know. They work fantastically, and um, the reports are that India is going to buy some of them. Uh, this is what I read in the papers. So this part of uh, you know Israel's policy of mowing the grass in Gaza this time has uh, backfired. Uh, then uh, the uh, other important. Uh, uh, you know, aftermath of this is that for the first time in, I think, more than uh, more than a decade, Palestinians have really united. You see that you saw protests erupt not only uh, in uh, occupied Palestine, but in Israel proper, in Jordan, in in uh, in Lebanon. In fact, Palestinians in Jordan and Lebanon tried their best to forcibly cross into. Uh, into uh, into Israel, into the West Bank, and to, into Israel to show their solidarity with the Palestinian, uh, with the uh, beleaguered people of uh, Gaza and the Palestinian people. So this, I think, for the first, and uh, even uh, the Hamas and the uh, Palestinian Authority, the PLO at the Fatah, I think now they are much closer than they were for, uh, for a long time. They are not trading barbs against each other uh, after what happened in, in Gaza. Although the Americans and the Israelis are trying their best to once again, you know, sow divisions among the Palestinian people. As the Krishna Swami said, you know, uh, the reconstruction aid in Gaza, uh, they are trying to play politics with that also. Krishna Swami says that Hamas is going to misuse those funds. But Hamas has been saying for a long time that, you know, look, uh, when, uh, when Gaza was bombed uh, in 2014 and before that, we didn't touch any of the aid money. It was all, all the reconstruction was done by UN agencies and other humanitarian aid groups. So, but this, uh, I think, uh, you know, this time, I think the, the Palestinian people are more united. At least they will be, they will remain united till the Palestinian uh, uh, elections are held, if they are held anytime soon. Because as after what happened in Gaza, after the heroic fight uh, Hamas put up, 
the Hamas, the popularity of Hamas has increased manifold. Uh, in fact, even uh, the other day, Hanan Ashrawi, who is, as everybody knows, one of the tallest Palestinian leaders, one of the most humane Palestinian leaders, also a Christian, he said uh, even Christians are going to vote, uh, are going to vote for Hamas if elections are held. Then, uh, so yeah. Then uh, the other important uh, uh, gain for the Palestinian people is that they cannot now take the support of the American government for granted. You know, bipartisan support for uh, Israel was almost guaranteed. But that has now changed. The speech of, uh, I mean, the article and the speeches made by uh, uh, progressive uh, Democrats, I mean, especially uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, the article he wrote in the New York Times, uh, criticizing, strongly criticizing the Israeli government. And as you know, Bernie Sanders is a liberal Jew. Uh, I don't know whether he's a practicing Jew. And uh, surprise, even more surprisingly, the article in the New York Times, the attitude of the New York Times has changed so drastically. And New York Times is one of the establishment newspapers of, of the United States. They, I was really surprised to see that they published an, an article in which they showed the pictures, the photographs of all more than, of the 52 children who were uh, killed by Israeli. Uh, bombs and planes and and uh, tank uh, 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 missile attacks uh, during the Gaza 11 day Gaza war. Uh, that I think is, is a momentous uh, change. And also the you know the uh, Black Lives Matter movement in the in the U.S. that also had an impact. So now in the, you know the, in the protests that were held all over the U.S. and other countries. There were big banners saying that, you know, Palestine lives also matter. Palestinian lives also matter. The, then the, um, uh, uh, Dr. Pradhan talked about the, uh, you know, targeting of uh, media houses and the demolitions of high-rise high buildings. Now, uh, you see, another, uh, even, in the, even in the 2000 and uh, 14 uh, attack on Gaza, uh, the Israelis targeted journalists and also particular families. Now, the Israelis being the occupying power, you know, they have the entire record. They know uh, the addresses of all the people living in Gaza, including the cell numbers, everything. They know their locations. So this time, too, journalists were targeted. Of course, you know, when the uh, building or uh, housing Al Jazeera was destroyed, they gave them two hours, a couple of hours notice. But in residential houses where journalists were saying no notice were given, they were just demolished. One Palestinian journalist was killed along with his entire family. And uh, But uh, this time, I think the Israelis are not going to get away that easily. You know, the UNHRC uh, uh, resolution, which was passed despite the opposition from uh, United States and uh, of course, United States is not a member of the UNHR, but uh, the Western countries. Um, uh, but uh, uh, and so now the um, the UNHCR, the United Nations, is now going to carry. Uh, they have decided to carry out an investigation on human rights, on uh, on 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 war crimes, on alleged war crimes that Israel has coming. Of course, there will be inquiry into both what uh, Hamas. Uh, on, on, on the rockets, uh, on the targeting of civilians by, by Hamas, and also, but you know, how many uh, uh, civilians were killed in Israel? Twelve, out of which uh, three were not even Israelis. I mean, they, one was an Indian, two were, I think, Thais, uh, and only one soldier was killed. So there is now going to be an inquiry. And uh, earlier this year, the uh, ICC has also decided to conduct an inquiry uh, into uh, war, Israeli war crimes in the occupied territories. Of course, along with, uh, you know, alleged Palestinian uh, war crime. So Israel is no longer getting a black check from the international community. Of course, it has got some new allies, uh, as you know, 
India being one, a tacit allies, let's put it, not open allies. Uh, and many authoritarian uh, regimes in the world are supporting Israel, including countries like, even Muslim countries like Azerbaijan. I know Israel played a big role in Azerbaijan's victory over Armenia in the war which took place last year. It was the uh, killer drones, uh, suicide drones supplied by Israel, which had a very important role to play in the ultimate victory. So, in the ultimate, uh, so uh, I think uh, Israel uh, uh, cl it claims of uh, scoring a victory is uh, you know it's not really you know highly uh, you know uh, not true. So um, uh, the the especially the claims of destroying the tunnels, I don't think it has um, uh, you know it's not uh, not, re not really. Uh, true either because if if uh, and they have claimed to kill uh, to kill many Hamas fighters. If that is true, I mean Hamas would have said that so many people have died, but now very few fighters, have, many many few of the fighters have died. Hamas has said only about five percent of the tunnels have been destroyed. So uh, you know the this war has ended in a stalemate. Hamas has uh, also gained a lot of uh, credibility internationally. Thank you. I will uh, leave the rest for question and answer. Thank you. Please unmute your mic, sir. Sorry for that confusion. I thought my mic was uh, unmuted. Uh, my apologies. Uh, let me start. Thank you, Dr. John Cherian, for that, um, you know, taking us uh, to the big picture, uh, which we often lose uh, in our discussions. You spoke about uh, international protests. That reminds us that uh, there was no protest in India. Uh, so the question is whether is it because of COVID-19 or even if there were no COVID-19, would there have been any protests in India? Then you spoke about uh, technology being tested on live human beings. Well, what an atrocity. You also said that uh, the Human Rights Council in uh, Geneva is going to make an investigation and that, um, you know, that will also include the sending of rockets uh, by Hamas targeting Israeli civilians. Now, I have a problem in understanding that. I'm not uh, saying that it is what you are saying, but what the council said. That is, to my mind, once the rockets are fired, the Hamas has no control over those rockets as to, you know, they only can direct it in a general way. They cannot target it properly. They lack the precision technology which uh, America has provided to Israel. So I suppose we have to be careful about it. The so-called talk of uh, targeting civilians by Hamas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a few questions and let us try to answer them one by one. First question I have is uh, from Anurag Seth from Noida. He says, sir, you focus on American weapons being used by Israel against Hamas in Gaza. Please also comment on thousands of rockets launched by Hamas on Israel. Where did these rockets come from and who funded these? I will give a brief answer, but uh, the panelists might uh, like to sort of, you know, expand on it. As far as I know, these rockets were made in Gaza 
by Hamas. I do not have any reason to believe that they came from outside because, you know, Israelis make sure that the nothing can enter Gaza. It is the largest open air prison in history. Now, Suman from uh, Amity has asked a question. What is the role of socio-political psychology for creating hybrid warfare in the context of Israel and Palestine conflict resolution? And the second question by the same person is why conflict management policy is more prominent compared to conflict resolution initiatives in the context of Israel and Palestine conflict? I have one more question, but that let uh, what I would like to see now is uh, the three panelists uh, giving us their views on the two on the three questions already raised. So this time, let us uh, start with uh, Professor uh, Banshidar Prathan. Yeah, I think uh, probably I want two questions. Uh, Gaza, Hamas uh, rockets you've already answered. You know, you must know these are all improvised. These are big firecrackers, as they call it, you know. This is basically a symbol of resistance. And Israel's Iron Dome is there to protect any any uh, rocket that comes. That's OK. Now, and Gaza is under siege for the last decade. Nothing will enter it. Nothing. Israel makes it so that. Now, the, someone raised the question of conflict management resolution. Yeah, that is precise what. Conflict resolution will happen only when the parties involved in the conflict will, are keen, keenly interested. In my own understanding, my own argument is Israel is not interested in this. Israel, the, the largest segment of the Israel political class, has not accepted Palestinians as a people deserving the right to national self-determination and political independence. <coughs> they have not accepted. So they, they are told the, the Zionist settler, settler project is on. They want to remove the Palestinians. That's the part that is not going to happen and that it will not happen. That's not happening. You know, and the, as for the most important mediator, US, I have never, I've always questioned the, um, you know, the US mediation because it's a party to the conflict. How can it mediate? It's a, one of the parties to the conflict on the side of Israel. It isn't always there. So you let Israel and, and, and now that is also changing in the US change within the in, in the Democratic Party itself uh, among the Jews coming to the younger Jews. They are questioning now. Some of the Democratic representatives are placing bills in the House of Representatives to conditional US military aid to Israel and to stop arms sales. They will not sail through immediately. But these are new signs. There are cracks within the Democratic Party voters, young voters. So I hope the any change and things will move towards conflict resolution only when the American public opinion and Israel public opinion change and there are signs they are changing. <coughs> Anything I left? Probably if I missed, I can. No, thank you. I think uh, you're covered very well. Now let us request uh, Professor Kumar as well. Um, thank you. Um, I want to make a, you know, about the rockets. Most of the rockets are developed internally, but there are also channels with Sinai. Very often Egyptians destroy them. There is enormous tunnel developments. Hamas itself admitted Israel destroyed only 5% of the tunnels, which means remaining 95% are still there. Number two. Three, uh, you know, large number of assistance to Gaza come through Israel. And this is where the dual use technology comes in. A lot of materials can be used for construction and also be used for rockets. This is the thing one which very often flagged around. You know, people talk about, you know, 200 plus Palestinians killed, about 13 people killed on the Israeli side. Let us be very honest. Hamas did not fire 4,000 rockets to kill 12 people. They would have killed dozens of them. They could not. So when you are talking about a disproportionate, you need to be a little careful when making an assessment. There are three reasons why the number of casualties on the Israeli side is small. One, about 600 of the 4,000 rockets fell in the Gaza Strip itself. They never crossed the Gaza Strip. The second thing is the Iron Dome anti-missile defense system. 
And more important, the third point is a large number of Israelis are well trained in uh, countermeasures. Most of the houses in the neighboring areas have a bunker or shelter. So people could go and hide with a, within 30 to 90 seconds warning. They were trained over a period of time. I think that is why the casualty is less. One word about UNHCR. It's a very nice to say United Nations has a prefix. We need to look at who are the members of UNHCR today. China, Russia, Pakistan, not long ago, Saudi Arabia. I think when you are making about UNHCR, you should be very careful. The countries whose track record is not very present by any standards, they are judging the standards of everybody, you and me. So I'm not saying only in the context of Israel, but I'm talking about globally. So this is like, you know, Butcher as an SPC president. I stop. Thank you, Professor Kumar Swami. Now, before we ask uh, Dr. John Sherian, I want to add one more question, which is specifically addressed to him. And that is uh, from Rohit Sharma, Bhopal. Dr. John Sherian, do you think that Iranian arms and military technology support to Hamas amplifies Israel security concerns and compel it to react more aggressively. So you have three questions now, Dr. John Chetty. Right, thank you. Thank you. No, uh, Hamas uh, in its statement said that it only uh, used, uh, I think they said, uh, less than 50% of its stock of uh, of missiles and rockets and that too of you know of the most primitive kinds because they say they have kept their more sophisticated uh, missiles for uh, you know they're expecting another big conflict with uh, israel i think the major point of what they uh, of the hamas what hamas wanted to show once you wanted to prove was that they could send even this crude uh, primitive compared to Israeli missiles all the way up to Tel Aviv, you know, the capital of uh, Israel. And uh, they were just showing their capabilities that, you know, that they could do that. And the other thing they proved was, which uh, Kumar Swami said, you know, uh, and, Kumar, and also uh, Bansidar say, uh, you know, talked about the so called, you know, the great Iron Dome, that the Iron Dome had a lot of holes. I mean, they could even stop primitive uh, rockets and missiles from uh, Hamas. So, and the Israelis are now going to rush to uh, Washington asking for $1 billion from the Biden administration to do, you know, repairs on the Iron Dope. Uh, so, and, uh, so then, uh, yeah, the, the question about Iranian help, I'm sure, you know, Iranian uh, must have provided them with, you know, you know, map, technology, crude, uh, this thing. because. Uh, I mean, Iran has not made any secret of its good relations with uh, with Hamas, but uh, there I don't. Uh, nobody, even the Americans, are, uh, have not said that Iranian weapons and Iranian missiles are being smuggled into Gaza. There is no way anything can be smuggled into Gaza. People are dying of hunger. The tunnels which they are building is for defensive purposes. When you know, to fight the Israelis when they come into uh, Gaza, if there is a, a land invasion. I mean, the uh, General Sisi is America's, uh, I mean, is one of his America, I don't use the word lapdog, but one of the closest allies of America. He has totally blockaded Gaza. It's the most blockaded uh, place in the, uh, in the whole world. I mean, two million people, uh, half the population children. Uh, so, yeah, so Israel, I'm, Iran and Hamas have a good relationship. Hamas also has good relationship with, with Qatar, with sheikhdoms like Qatar. Uh, and and the Muslim Brotherhood parties in general, but I do not think that uh, uh, Israel, uh, Iranian arms are being smuggled into uh, into Gaza. It, this is basically their own technology. I'm sure the the drawings and all, but this is not the more uh, the kind of uh, missiles they have so far used are not sophisticated at all. Thank you. Oh, the second, the other thing about uh, uh, yeah about peace uh, between Palestinians and. Uh, 
uh, and is there's no way there's going to be peace in our uh, i don't know not my lifetime but i'm i'm old now but maybe uh, your lifetime the the uh, the, uh, the question, guy who asked the question may be young i hope so but you see the kind of leadership israel has thrown up the naftali bennett who's going to be the next prime minister he has openly said i have killed many arabs you don't have to feel sorry about it uh, <laughs> there's nothing to worry about it so i I mean, he, and he has said, no way there can be a uh, state, independent state for Palestine. So the two-state, anyway, uh, uh, the two-state uh, solution is out. There has to be a one-state solution. And uh, the apartheid policies have to, be end, have to end, and Palestinians have to be given equal rights. There's no other way. And otherwise, the, uh, Israel, like other col uh, uh, colonial enterprises, like in uh, French in Algeria, whites in South Africa, we'll have to ultimately collapse, not in our lifetime, but it has to, that is history. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John Sherian. Uh, if uh, the distinguished panelists agree, I am going to ask one more question from the audience. Okay. And that question is from Air Marshal Naresh Verma, Vasan Kunj, Delhi. There is now talk of three-state solution, that is Israel, West Bank and Gaza. Also, some say that there is merit in 2.5 state solution, that is pursuing a West Bank first, negotiating strategy and then incentivizing Gaza to join later. What are the views of the panel? So let us uh, start with uh, Professor Kumar Swami. Um, okay. Right now, a de facto three-state proposal is existing. The West Bank and Gaza don't talk to each other. The, the negotiation, the word, in the last 15 years is used to indicate talks between Hamas and Fatah, not between the Palestinian Authority and Israel. We need to be very clear about that. So Hamas and uh, people are very familiar. Mahmoud Abbas came to India five times since taking office. He could not visit even once to Gaza Strip. That is a reality. So West Bank and Gaza do not talk to each other in the political sense of the word. Right now, the delegations are in Cairo, but they have not met to face to face. They are talking to Egyptians separately. So three-state solution is existing one, but it is not a viable one. But one state solution is very attractive. People have suggested about it. They said very inclusive state. I would be very happy to know in the last uh, 2000 years, when was it an inclusive state existed in West Asia? In the religious sense of the word, in the ethnic sense of the word, equality doesn't exist in our region. I think yeah, or if somebody is talking, we are looking at an inclusive state, I don't know, they are looking at the Soviet model or a Russian model or what model we are talking about. If you want to go back to history, there is no reference point. If you want to say this is an ideal state, we want an equality. So one state solution basically would mean destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. But the most viable one will be a two state. You have your own state, I have my own state. But that is going to be the only way out sooner or later. But the only drawback is it will not happen in my lifetime. The, the modalities will have to be negotiated. What is the border? What is the size of the state? What is the other parameters will have to be negotiated by the parties concerned. It will not be dictated by a third party. So when it's very one, no, I've seen so many articles, people are writing one state solution. They simply do not know Middle Eastern reality. At least Islam, you can say golden age of Islam. But in the Arab world, where is the golden age? When was the golden age when an Arab and non-Arab, a Muslim and a non-Muslim lived as equal? Never. So one state is not possible. Three state is not viable in the long run. It exists as a reality. But the most viable is a two state solution. But we need to work towards it rather than dismissing it because it's not happening in our lifetime. We need to work towards it. Thank you, Professor Kumar Swami. Now let us request uh, Professor Pradhan. Yeah. 
Okay, I think if I understood the question correctly, because there are some audio problem about state sources. Yeah, I am one of those who believe and continue to believe that the best solution is two state solution. But there is a catch. Two state solution, not the way Israel thinks. 60% of the sea taking away, next thing, then leave it. Palestinians will not compromise anything other than West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem. But all depends on Israel. Does Israel want it? Because if it doesn't want it, then they'll be forced to go back to one state. So look at the population demography. In the Israel population is around 8 million, out of which 2 million are Arab Palestinian Israelis. Mix those 2 millions with the Palestinians, West Bank and Gaza is equal, almost equal, or Palestinian will be in a majority. How does Israel deal with them? In what setup? So it is an Israel interest I've been always arguing. That it's time that the Israelis should agree to give the Palestinians their due, legitimate due. They are demanding 22% of historical Palestine, just 22%, West Bank Gaza. And uh, I, my own take is Hamas and gradually Abbas and Fatah will be marginalized in the past Palestinian politics. There are enough indications of that. That's why they are not holding elections. There are internal internal struggles within Fatah. Arafat's nephew, Marwan Barghouti, Muhammad Dalan, they learn many. So therefore the Hamas message is getting traction among the Palestinians. And this message was received across the world. The solidarity movement across the globe is for what? The solidarity movement across the globe is for give the Palestinians the review that's a legitimate sovereign state. So for me, still it is it can be it is possible provided the Israeli political class accept the Palestinian as a people and two states living side by side. That is long back Arafat has accepted in, two, in 1988. Even please remember, there is a misperson across the globe that Hamas is not. Hamas has also accepted two state solution. When it talked about in a foundational principle documents, it talked about accepting a state along 1967 border. People should understand facts. So the Israelis are not interested. It's a, everything depends on the Israelis. <laughs> Palestinians have nothing to lose except their occupation. Thank you, Professor Prathan. Uh, Dr. John Chen. No, like I said earlier, the Palestinians are now most, much more united after what happened in Gaza in May. Uh, it, it, the, uh, the Fatah is no longer a monolithic group. Uh, I, it has already split into three major factions, and they are contesting, you know, going to contest against each other when the elections are going to be held, and the general elections will be held. They have to hold it some, uh, you know, if not this year, uh, definitely by next year. And uh, I mean, that election will throw up, I think, a much more united uh, Palestinian uh, leadership. And uh, uh, so there is hope for, uh, you know, for Palestinian unity. I mean, the Israel and, uh, and even now the United States, they tried to stigmatize uh, Hamas as a terrorist uh, organization. We'll have nothing to do with it. But the reality is that, I mean, they are the most popular party. Among the, uh, among the among the Palestinian among the Palestinians and and they have shown that the only one there was only ones who were ready to fight on behalf of the Palestinians when the Israelis uh, security forces were running berserk in Jerusalem and uh, uh, different cities of uh, of Israel you know when uh, Palestinians were being lynched on the streets by uh, Israeli mo Jewish mobs thank you Thank you, Dr. John Cherian. Uh, we have to conclude now. I do not wish to sum up, but just only one or two remarks. Uh, one is that uh, I wish we had more time to talk about Hamas because, uh, as Dr. John Cherian said, they have been branded as terrorists. Well, it is true that they do undertake violent attacks, but to brand them as terrorists, well, does not make that sense. And let us not forget that in 2006, January, Hamas won the election against Fatah, Fatah which was supported by Israel and the United States, which sent $2.3 million for Dr. Mahmoud Abbas to replenish, I mean, to, you know, shore up his image. So 
part of the reason for Palestinian disunity is Israel's actions. Now, whether they will stop doing it, I do not know. Perhaps not in our lifetime. Now, coming to the two-state solution, one-state solution, three-state, and 2.5, the fact of the matter is that Israeli leadership, as constituted now, has no interest in seeking a solution. It will be done by Israel will agree to it only under compulsion. And the only power in the world that can compel the United States, Israel is the United States. Will the United States ever do it? We do not know. But there are no signs. So, let us, ladies and gentlemen, give a big applause to our distinguished panelists electronically. Thank you. And distinguished panelists, let's give a big applause to that distinguished audience. And let us say thank you to Tete once again for bringing us all together. Exactly. Thank you, ladies thank and gentlemen. You. Thank you, distinguished panelists. Thank you so much.